Conservative Book Club members, thank you for listening to our weekly author interview series. I'm Chris Malagisi, editor-in-chief of the Conservative Book Club, now with over 760,000 members across the country. We have a very special author with us today, Stephen Mansfield, who wrote the book Choosing Donald Trump, God, Anger, Hope, and Why Christian Conservatives Supported Him. The book itself is perhaps the big question that it, that it asks is, how exactly did someone like Donald Trump, who somewhat crass, uh, unrepentant in a way, uh, reality TV star and cutthroat business tycoon, secure the majority of the religious conservative vote? He was the author of The Faith of George W. Bush and The Faith of Barack Obama. Uh, he, many people may be familiar with The Faith of George W. Bush. It was a book that I read years ago and, and uh, found wonderful. Uh, very thoughtfully, the very thoughtful, meticulous research and personal interviews were done. Um, and a little bit about Stephen and his background. He first rose to global attention with his, uh, that groundbreaking book, The Faith of George W. Bush. Uh, he also wrote a book about the faith of Barack Obama, which was another international bestseller, and he's written other biographies by about Booker T. Washington, Winston Churchill, Pope Benedict XVI, and Abraham Lincoln, among others. He speaks widely about men, leadership, faith, the lessons of history, and the forces that shape modern culture. He's a much-in-demand leadership and communications coach whose firm, the Mansfield Group, is located in Washington, D.C., but he lives in Nashville in the nation's capital with his wife, Beverly, an award-winning songwriter and producer, and you can also check out his website at stephenmansfield.tv. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for that kind introduction. Well, congratulations to you on the book. Why don't you tell our members a little bit about it? Well, you know, I'm fascinated with the influence of faith in American culture and global culture, and I'm particularly interested in the influence of faith on presidential politics and presidential administrations. So obviously the 2016 election was fraught with religious issues, and I think most people were surprised, the majority of us were surprised, that Donald Trump uh, took as many as 81% of the white evangelical vote, took half of all churchgoers in America, uh, half of all Roman Catholics. And so I wanted to just do look at why, and I also wanted to look at his religious background and see if we could discern any uh, patterns that would help us anticipate what he would do in the Oval Office. Absolutely. You know, I found it fascinating how early on many of the religious conserv Christian conservative leaders uh, jumped on the Trump train. Um, so why did Christian conservatives end up supporting uh, Trump and voting for him? Well, it's, I think it was a very interesting time, almost a perfect storm of factors. You have to realize that most religious conservatives in America felt traumatized by the Obama years and terrified of the Hillary Clinton presidency or the possibility of a Clinton presidency. Um, during the Obama years, and I, I understand that not everyone felt this way, but the majority of religious uh, voters, uh, conservative religious voters, uh, felt that the, the president, President Obama, had been a full, just an outspoken advocate for uh, pro-choice or pro-abortion. Uh, politics. He had been a champion of LGBT issues. Um, but I think it was the lawsuits by his Justice Department that really uh, terrified uh, the religious conservatives. If, you know, we, we all know the stories of a, of a small order of nuns being sued by the Justice mm -hmm. Department. We know um, the, the Obama administration's support for the baker who didn't want to make a cake for uh, a same-sex mm -hmm. wedding. And then, of course, the big issue that circulated very broadly uh, in evangelical and religious conservative world world uh, was the Hobby Lobby situation, where the Green family, the owners of Hobby Lobby, were being sued to the tune of a million three a day in fines mm -hmm. uh, because they did not want to offer abortive of facings as part of their insurance coverage for their employees, and that ended up going before the Supreme Court. So that may not have echoed in, in every listener's, all of our listeners' um, worlds, but it certainly echoed largely in a conservative religious world, evangelical world. And then, of course, all of them looked at the Hillary Clinton presidency, the possibility of it, and, and saw more of the same. Um, so they were angry, they were uh, fearful, uh, they were hoping for a change. We also have to realize that during the primary, uh, during the primaries, Republican primaries, uh, uh, Donald Trump did not get the majority of the evangelical vote. So it wasn't until it really came down to a choice between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, who most religious conservatives feared, that people said, look, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go with Trump, crass though he is, maybe not uh, consistently religious, though he is, with a, maybe more greater 
immorality in his background, uh, we'll go with him rather than Hillary Clinton. And that, that really is the majority of how things, uh, of why things that lean the way they did in that election. No, I think you, it's an accurate portrayal of what had taken place and uh, put it much better than I could have. Um, now, let, let's talk about Trump, though, a little bit. Trump says he's a Presbyterian, uh, and he was highly influenced by a man named Norman Peale, who you were also write about in your book. Uh, for our listeners who may not know, Norman Peale uh, was the author of The Power of Positive Thinking, and uh, Trump, throughout the campaign, had said that he described Peale's influence on him as being one that was significant. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that influenced Trump and his views on religion? Yes, uh, you know, Norman Vincent Peale actually said that Trump was his greatest disciple, and I, I, I see every day the influence of uh, Norman Vincent Peale upon Donald Trump. Uh, Norman Vincent Peale was a minister at Marvel Collegiate Church in Manhattan, and uh, he, he absolutely believed at the core level in what we would call the born-again Christianity, traditional, born-again, commit to Jesus, believe in his resurrection kind of Christianity. But publicly, outside of his church, he was known as uh, a, really what we would call today a motive motivational speaker. Uh, he, he, many of the phrases that we use today in motivational culture, uh, motivational thinking, motivational conferences uh, were his. Again, the power of positive thinking. If you can conceive it, you can achieve it. Um, your words change your reality, things of that nature. And th this was the side of Norman Vincent Peale that Donald Trump uh, drew from most. And we see the influence of it every day. For example, one of uh, Norman Vincent Peale's phrases was, attitudes are more important than facts. Well, we, say, we constantly see Trump uh, focusing on the attitude towards a fact or oh. towards the attitude about a given situation and diminishing the value of actual stats or, or facts. So this is very much the influence of Norman Vincent Peale, and I think the man that we have in the White House today is, is a product of that more public motivational side of Norman Vincent Peale. What's, what's interesting is that he didn't draw from the more born-again, more be, be transformed by God, you know, be changed into the image of Jesus kind of message, and so so you, that, that emphasis may be more newfound in his life as some of the people who are around him now ha are having influence on him. So you see a tug of war, I think, even in his soul, and this explains a lot of who we have in the Oval Office now. Does Trump go to church? Does he um, participate in religious activities on a weekly, monthly occasion? And in, in all your research, um, what, what did you discover when you were researching his religious habits? Trump stopped going to church regularly when Norman Vincent Peale died in the early 90s. He's not been a regular church attender by his own admission. Um, he does like to watch TV preachers. This is what brought him in relationship, for example, with Paula White, who has had a profound influence upon his presidency and upon his candidacy. Um, and so he likes TV preachers. He, li he revered, I think because of the influence of Norman Vincent Peale, he reveres those who are pulpiteers. He reveres those who he perceives to speak for God. Um, he likes hanging with them. That's why he asked Paula White to create listening sessions around the country where he gathered, she gathered uh, large groups of uh, clergy and uh, from every persuasion and he heard them out. And that's, of course, where he learned about the Johnson Amend Amendment and, and uh, religious mm -hmm. liberty issues and some of the, the, the challenges these clergymen were, were fighting. Uh, so all of that to say that uh, he, does, he doesn't go to church regularly, but he does uh, listen to counselors like Paula White. He does pay attention to TV preachers. Uh, he does listen to his evangelical council, um, but he, he's a mixed bag, and, and even those on that council know that. Do you believe that the Christian conservatives are uh, still supporting Trump? I mean, obviously, they're probably very happy with uh, the Neil Gorsuch uh, Supreme Court nomination, perhaps even the transgender uh, issue in regards to the, to the military, um, but are they still confident in him? Do they still support him today? I meet two types of uh, religious conservatives uh, who are currently interacting with the Trump administration. One type of conservative, man on the street type of conservative, is one who says, look, I'm willing to put up with all kinds of stuff. They'll use words like crap and garbage and crassness and what have you. Uh, I'm willing to put up with all of that if he just appoints good people to the Supreme Court and holds the line on a couple of issues. And usually that's abortion and maybe LGBT things and maybe some religious liberty issues. Other evangelicals I meet are, are, are dealing 
with some buyer's remorse. They're put off by his, uh, you know, calling the NFL players SOBs. They're put off by him picking Twitter wars with, uh, you, you know, the mayor of San Juan while she's standing elbow deep in the waters of Irma and Puerto Rico. Um, they're put off by uh, the chaos in the White House. And so I think you've got basically two kinds of people who, who uh, supported him originally and now are having to decide where they are. I'd say the majority are still hanging in with him. He hasn't done anything to lose them, and they're willing to swallow a whole lot of non-presidential uh, style and culture uh, in order for the few issues that they are that are hot button issues for them uh, to be be tended by him, to be championed by him. But others are definitely feeling some buyer's remorse. They're definitely backing away. The statistics show that he's lost oh maybe 20 percent, roughly, uh, of his evangelical full throated support, and um, and I think that 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 may continue. It's all up to how he conducts himself from here on out. Stephen, just one last question. If our members were to read your book, what are one, two, or three things that you would like them to take away after reading your book? I'd like for them to understand the issues that came to play in the 2016 election. I think they're critical, and I think we'll see them repeated. I'd like for them to understand the spiritual biography, so to speak, of Donald Trump and to understand what shaped him, what molded him, from parents to Norman Vincent Peale to military school to uh, Roy Cohn, who is a major figure, a major mentor to him. And I, and I think that one of the themes that's, that's big in the book that I care very much about is the way that uh, public figures uh, on, uh, who were religious leaders on the right, uh, conservative religious leaders, the uh, prominent TV ministries and so on, um, the way they supported Trump in such a full-throated way, uh, saying that he was Churchill, saying that he was Lincoln, saying that he was Cyrus the Great, saying that he was, uh, you know, like Reagan, etc., uh, perhaps overselling him to their congregations and to the public. Um, I, I, I use the phrase prophetic distance. What, what I would have liked to have seen and what I think that we'll need to learn how to do in the future is to call a man to his best, uh, hold up the moral values that we believe in, uh, for him and urge him in that direction, but that doesn't that's not the same thing as you know to use our crass phrase getting in bed with him or joining his PR team. So a good portion of the book is devoted to how these uh, religious leaders, uh, I think out of their fear of Obama and Hillary Clinton, uh, gave over, oversold him in a way that they, they may deal with some blowback about now um, if, if he doesn't begin to prove himself better. I think that's a major theme and one I'd like for the readers to really delve into. Thank you very much, Stephen. We really appreciate you coming on, and congratulations on your new book, Choosing Donald Trump, God, Anger, Hope, and Why Christian Conservatives Supported Him. With CBC members, make sure to check out Stephen's profile on conservativebookclub.com, as well as the book, and uh, we hope you purchase it. Stephen, thank you so much again for joining us today, and congrats. Great to be with you. I enjoyed it. Enjoyed it very much. Thanks again.